Hello, welcome, thanks for joining me again at this uh, Deuze vlog, uh, my series of vlogs where I uh, uh, interview or sit down with uh, my academic heroes in the field of journalism and media studies. And, and, and you know, please subscribe, like, uh, share a comment, share it with your friends, with your students, with your colleagues, if you find any of these interviews useful. I just hope it puts... Um, a human face on the literature all of us cite and 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 and, and teach with and 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 study. Um, today, I think we're in for a treat. Um, uh, I had the, the privilege to sit down with my dear old friend Barbie Zelizer. Barbie um, is the Raymond Williams Professor of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, where she's also directing the Center for Media at Risk, and she's the Associate Dean for research there. And Barbie has had a, 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 a fabulous career over many decades uh, through which we've come to know her work and her dedication to, as one of the titles of her books suggests, taking journalism seriously. Um, she uh, is the um, uh, past president of the International Communication Association. Um, she's, of course, one of the founding editors and co-editor of the journal Journalism Theory, Practice and Criticism, um, uh, receiving many prestigious fellowships throughout her career, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, as well as a fellowship from Harvard University's Joan Shorenstein Center. Um, this year, she was uh, in 2020. Um, she was uh, elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as well. And what we'll be talking about today are, um, well, it's it runs the gamut of her entire career. Uh, we'll start with um, some of her foundational work on the power of images, and not just images, but the way certain images throughout time, throughout history, come to define how we make sense of our current moment. Um, and, 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 and this argument that she originally made in the early 1990s is perhaps all the more relevant uh, today. Uh, we'll talk about literacy, media literacy, as an absolute necessity, but still somewhat absent tool uh, in uh, teaching, not just the teaching of journalists, but the teaching of all kids everywhere. Um, we'll talk about how journalism seems so oblivious to the lessons it could have learned from the way it functioned in the past, not just in its own country or region, but elsewhere in the world. For example, how it can or should stand up against authoritarianism and populism uh, that are um, uh, popping up all over the world today. And of course, uh, we're going to talk at the end to a topic one of the many topics that I talk with with Barbie that's very near and dear to my heart, which is to broaden our understanding of what journalism is, or as the title of her 2017 book uh, with Polity Press suggests, what journalism could be. All the things that journalism is that escape our perhaps narrow definitions in our handbooks, in our teaching manuals, in our core courses, and, and celebrating this craftsmanship and this creativity that is absolutely core to what it is uh, like and what it perhaps should be like to be a journalist uh, next to mastering a certain type of technology. Um, I hope you enjoy this conversation and um, hey, if you like me to interview your academic heroes, um, drop me a line, leave a comment. Um, I have a long wish list and the, the wish list can only get bigger. Um, uh, and thanks again, and uh, uh, see you soon. So um, yeah, yeah, let's let's just get started. Um, first of all, hello, Barbie. <laughs> and, hello, and, Mark. Yeah, hi. I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Lovely if that you, that you make some time uh, to be here. I, I realize that all of us and you especially are about. Uh, five times as busy as we normally are around this time of year. As, I mean, before anything else, how are you doing during all of this? Doing okay. I mean, I think like everybody, I've had my ups and downs. Um, I think this has been a time in which we've learned to see 
the best and the worst. And it's mm. often the best in the worst people and the worst in the best people, you know? Mm. So I think that, you know, I feel like we're in a, an ongoing experiment. Um, and there's no right way to get through this. Um, there's no right way to make it easier um, for anybody, e even across time, you know? So I think that we're all kind of fluid. Um, but look, I'm healthy. I'm 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 still standing. I have a home. I have a job, and I know that that puts me um, in a very privileged uh, minority. So I I think it's important to keep the contacts right, very sharp and very um, kind of um, honing in on you as you mm. as you go through um, these days, and you know contemplate the difficulties. Um. um I mean, talking about home, I, I, I see you're in your lovely home in Philadelphia. Did, did you at any point during this whole say, this situation like went out into nature? As you see, a lot of people have been doing this sort of camping or all of a sudden people turn out to have a yeah. second home somewhere or, or, or did you stay put uh, uh, in the city? Well, you're hitting on a very, very sensitive spot. I did <laughs> stay in the city quite a lot. However, I also have ventured out to uh, the Delaware Bay area. Oh, um, that's where I get my, my kind of, that's where I center myself and get replenished. Um, um, but regarding right. to our work, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that, that you're taking the time to, to chat uh, with me today. Um, and, and I want to use that time, the time we have to talk about a bunch of different things. I mean, obviously, some of your more recent work um, and, and forthcoming work that I would love to, to chat about. But to begin with, I want to go back a little bit to uh, the work that I got to know you from. And um, that, if I look back on it now, make some points that are really interesting and relevant uh, today. I mean, in, in, the, in the 90s, um, you received, uh, among other things, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and you used that to, to write a book on the Holocaust, or specifically on the, way, the visual representation of the liberation of the concentration camps. Um, and um, you remarked in that book how we perhaps still underappreciate not just the power of images, but specifically the power of certain images, the images of the past that we use to make sense of what we see today, right? And how these images resonate across time and, and sort of fix uh, our interpretation of what's happening. And, and in, in that book, in this 1990, 1995 book, you write, um, um, as image making, making technologies become more sophisticated and diverse over the coming century, this, this appreciation or underappreciation of, of visuals is, is, is a really important issue. And, and I mean, this has, of course, been um, an exceptionally powerful point. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that insight and the work that you did at that time for you still resonates today and, and, and how it still shapes your, 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 your thinking about not just about journalism, but about the way we make sense of things uh, today. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. It's a, it's a great question to kind of start off our conversation. I mean, I think that I always write a book around a question that is left unresolved from the book before. And so when I had been working earlier on the Kennedy assassination, I had been looking at images and trying to get a sense of why it was that particularly as mnemonic, as memory-like images, memory-like tools alongside the recording that they actually do, why was it images were in this weird place? And so I started remembering to forget as a 150 year examination of the tension between images and words. And of course, that's undoable. Um, and as I kind of tried to figure out more acutely what it was I wanted to look at, I honed it down, honed it down, honed it down till I could figure, finally, finally land on one kind of event that really needed images to tell the story, that absolutely depended on images, that words were not cutting the grain in getting people to understand what the news was recorded. And of course, it was the liberation of the concentration camps in World War II. This did not start out to be a Holocaust book. 
Um, and people will often approach me as the Holocaust scholar, and I, I'm not. I, mm. I'm a media scholar who used the Holocaust to make a point about media tools. And so what I found was that d even in, in an event that, and, you know, just a teensy bit of history, I mean, this was a point in time when nobody was understanding what was going on in the Nazi concentration camps. Nobody was believing it. It was being reported, but on inside newspaper pages, inside of journals, um, uh, without any images. And it was only when the images came into, into play that people began to wrestle with this reality that was taking place. And so that struck me as an absolutely fascinating moment to kind of delve into, right? This moment at which images clearly needed, were needed to understand the news, um, and yet really didn't play the part that we might think. And when you say that, you know, you know that the, as the technology got better, the, you know, the, the question of what we do with images, which have always been a second-class citizen in the news, um, secondary adjunct to words at their side, right, used as illustrations or anecdotes, not as the kind of fundamental um, uh, fact of a given news record, um, one would think that with all the technology increasing and enhancing and getting more and complex and more complicated, that, w that images would take a, an ever more central role, right, in helping us engage with the world beyond our grasp. But that hasn't been the case, right? And particularly, it hasn't been the case around the kind of image that is most necessary for us to understand what goes on in the world. And this is images about violence. It's images about loss. It's images about death and war and terror. That's when we really need images, right? That's when we really need to see some representation of what's going on, particularly if we are not living through that reality. And yet what we see is that images have not kind of taken over front stage. And I, I always say that, you know, if you think about, you know, the images in our, in our visual culture, culture we're, we are an absolutely ocular centric uh, culture and we live amidst images. Hmm. But images of war and death and violence, we see much more on crime dramas, hmm. TV serials, movies, than we do in the news. And that is bizarre. Hmm. That is just a bizarre, it's a bizarre state of affairs by which images have been censored out of the reality documents that they are most necessary to, to, uh, to help prove. And so the technology hasn't really helped very much at all. And I think, you know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, ever since the liberation of the concentration camps in the 1940s, when we had a political mandate to see the images, right? This was a point in time in which generals were going out and saying, you must see these. They were pulling German citizens onto the streets, sidewalk exhibits, um, of photos that had been blown up to be, to be shown in magnified uh, condition. Um, soldiers were, uh, photojournalists, phot photographers who were working with the, with the uh, armed forces were told if they were anywhere within 100 kilometers of a concentration camp, they were to turn around, go there and map the place with images. So there was a political mandate to see, there was a moral mandate to see, mm. obviously, Right, this was about the Allied forces, uh, you know, kind of reigning victorious over the uh, Axis powers and over Nazism. Um, so that as the story of what the Nazis were about became more and more clear, it was more and more necessary to see those images. Um, and then we had we had the technological capacity because this is really one of the first times in which images could go over the wires and get to their place of destination as quickly as words. There wasn't a delay. That is the last time, the last time that we saw as full a display of images of death and violence and horror and war and terror since, since the 1940s. Like never again have we seen that degree of graphicness. Mm. That is weird. And that is something that I think we should be wrestling with much more than we do. 
it's something that I think we should be we should be harping on much more than we do. It's something that I think um, not only scholars but media practitioners themselves should be insisting on, and politicians and educators of all sorts um, really should be understanding what what kind of a, of a public sphere we are creating, that we allow these images to kind of fade out um, uh, before they're due. So, I, I, you know, well, technology aside, we haven't gotten to a better place with images. And I think this is a real, real tragedy. And now this observation is, is, is particular to journalism. How about our social media environment? Because one thing that is really interesting in this context to me is is the way the platforms that are increasingly dominating our sort of media diet uh, the, the twitters and the facebooks and uh, and and so on of this world how they are grappling with issues of call it censorship or just at some kind of, kind of control over what gets shared through their platforms often not necessarily based on any kind of clear moral ethical basis but more on a fear of being legislated against um and of course right. people use these right. media to share you know anything including the kind of images that you see we sometimes perhaps need but without context right. of course i mean right. how, how right. do you see that kind of uh well, visual you know, environment yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you went there in terms of the control of the platforms. I thought you were going to go in the opposite direction, which is the kind of free for all um, that much of the platform constitutes when you compare it with the mainstream news, if there ever was such a thing. Sure. Um, look, I think that any time you have a commercial platform, that commercial platform is going to be doing its own censorship. We may not call it censorship. But it's going to have its own its own uh, standards, its own priorities. Um, the sad part for me is that in the news media, you know, that that I don't think that we've we although we we lament the fact that there are commercial media and we 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 you know herald the return you know of public media. Um, I don't think that we've thought enough about what that kind of commercial presence does in terms of kind of etching out for us an environment, a visual environment in which we can see what it is we imagine. And so it's very interesting because I think that in the very beginning when, you know, when social media was like kind of booming and, and I would give a talk about images and one of the questions I would always get is, well, it's not the same anymore. You, you have images of everything. There are graphic images out there. And that is true. There are graphic images out there. There were always graphic images out there. There were always graphic images taken. The question is what main, creates a kind of mainstay presence in the record, circulates, recirculates, right? And then becomes a kind of iconic image for the next atrocity or war or terror. So it's not that, you know, there, you know, I mean, one of, one of the things I did after I, I uh, finished the, remembering to forget is I went and I found liberators, uh, uh, US Army liberators oh. who had a, uh, a well, well narrated habit of taking, you know, little brownie cameras, taking snapshots of atrocities, of bodies, of, um, we're about to be joined by a very large dog. I'm just, I'm just sharing that. Um, uh, like, took pictures of atrocities and kept them in a very private place. So you find them in attics, you find them in closed, locked boxes, you find them uh, stored away with, with you know, safe keepings and safety deposit boxes. And as these liberators died and passed on, often their families would try and, and, and share these photographic images um, uh, uh, in some kind of public uh, public capacity. So there's always been these images. They've always been there. It's just that they don't make it in because either political or commercial imperatives say uh, uh, up, up till here and from here no more. But what I was going to say about the kind of influx of images is that, you know, we all 
visualize things in ways that we don't even recognize has already become our kind of liter liter li li literal um, visual map, right? A kind of mapscape for what is possible to see. And so something as, uh, some might say major, some might say minor, as, as, as particular as images of the crucifixion, for instance, mm -hmm. um, largely that emerged uh, from around the time of Christ, have, have kind of recapitulated and moved into social media postings. They, you know, the, the kind, the stance mm -hmm for signifying personal suffering at the, at the cost or, or for the sake of, of the public good. Um, that kind of image that dates back to the crucifixion, you can find all over the place, not just in news images or not just in, in art, but in personal, you know, the way we actually take an actual, you know, uh, picture, you know, with our, with our phone. So I think that there's a kind of literacy here that we don't really get away from as much as we'd like to think that we're being, um, you know, very individualistic in the pictures that we take. This this argument about, I mean, it, it requires a kind of literacy, as you say, right? And 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 you've made this argument um, in the past about how, if we talk about journalism education in. Sp in particularly, but I would probably argue, and you, as, I assume as well, in, 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 in any kind of education, we need so much more emphasis on literacies, and, and specifically a kind of media literacy, an historical one, of course, but also a, a literacy of the tools that we use beyond um, uh, the, and the sort of an instrumental approach, like this is the right button to push but understanding right. how conventions and norms and values are embedded in the tools that we use. Uh, to what extent do you see that that kind of teaching is lacking at the moment in, in the way we are thinking or discussing what journalism education is like or should be like? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not just journalism education, or, or maybe I'm taking it in a very American sense. It's, it's, it, it is media literacy. It's, it's right. understanding the ways in which the tools themselves shape what it is we think we know. Um, in my view, this should be thrown into elementary education, elementary, high school, certainly college. I mean, by the time somebody finishes formal learning, they should understand the difference, right? Between, you know, hearing an acoustic record of something on the radio, right? Or in a podcast versus seeing a, an actual documentary film on your phone, on your iPad, on your television screen, right? Mm. Or whatever we call them now, you know? So I think I, I, we just don't, we don't have that. We don't have that. And, and I know that in the United States that shows because I mean, there certainly there are places where people are trying. I don't mean to say that there are no attempts um, at creating media literacy, but a kind of universal uh, necessity um, seeing it as uh, as an impediment to civic engagement, the mm. fact that we don't have it, uh, that 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 needs to be far more developed. Um, and I, you know, in the United States, certainly, I mean, the fact that people, you know, get the news usually from one source, mm. that's horrifying to me. Right. That is horrifying to me. Yeah. And and you know, nobody really nobody really problematizes that. And so the fact that we are as polarized in the United States as we are today, I mean, why, why wouldn't we be, right? Because there's never been anything that forces anybody to understand how, what the platform through which they are engaging with information is by definition changing the information that they get. Um, this, this argument about literacy um, and media literacy in general, um, just a quick context, uh, um, the, the Dutch government a couple of years ago wrote a new sort of government contract or mandate and in it they said that by, by 2020 they wanted all uh, um, uh, primary and secondary uh, schools in the Netherlands, uh, all forms of primary and secondary education to have in place a digital literacy curriculum. 
and they started a range of consultations, uh, appointed a group of teachers to, to develop a curriculum like that. And, and uh, I was involved with those consultations as a sort of external expert. And just to comment on the documents that they came up with. And what was really fascinating to me is that, so they ended up producing like a 150 page document about what these kids should be learning, right? About media, about the tools and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I did a, 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 a word search for the words um, creative or creativity, and it was nowhere. Um, and so there was nothing in the entire document about understanding the way media are made and making your own. And, and the reason why I'm telling you this is that, that um, so I, I, I want to acknowledge that, yes, there are, like you said, attempts to, to, to formulate a sort of coherent universal policy towards media literacy. Because, I mean, people are beginning to realize this is pretty fundamental next to math and English, right? You, you kind of know, you understand the media. Um, but um, it, it, it gets stuck in a very technologically driven or instrumental approach where it is sort of you see the tools and you use the tools rather than you understand the tools and, and turn them into things that you want to do stuff with. And, and now the reason why I'm telling you this too is because I want to build a bridge between that experience that I had and your comments about literacy to comments you've made about the way we define and study journalism today. Because you, you've made a point in a couple of uh, recent papers that although understandable and important that we talk about journalism in a digital context and, and what happens to journalism as it moves online and as it embraces all kinds of different media and does multimedia storytelling and all that lovely beautiful stuff is that that we perhaps at some point lose sight of journalism not so much as a series of technologies that are used like online journalism or broadcast journalism or whatever but as you call them a series of impulses uh, including uh, uh, curiosity and, and exploration and you note in that very specifically creativity and and i i was really uh, uh, yeah that really uh, uh, hit home for me is that how how Often I notice that in our field, we don't talk about journalism in terms of, I would almost say the craft, right? The, the making yes, of, the, 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 the fun in creating something beautiful and, and being creative. Uh, how, how do you uh, see uh, that play out in, from where you're looking at things? Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. I've been arguing this for quite some time. And I think that the, the inability to look at journalism as a craft, right? And it's not just creativity, it's inquisitiveness, it's resourcefulness, it's um, excitement, it's curiosity, you know, it's all this stuff that anybody who knows, who has been a journalist knows, you can't do squat unless you have that inside of you. Right. And the fact that it has never been codified, that it's never been identified, it's never been codified, it isn't taught, um, is about kind of controlling the canon, right? So mm -hmm. we teach the things that we can control, we can measure, we can be sure that they make it into our textbooks, that we can be sure that our students wow. learn them. Yeah. Um, and it absolutely, takes away the carpet from under underneath what journalism really is about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, when you combine that on the one hand with the other set of what I would call missed opportunities in thinking about journalism, which is this insistence on um, a kind of set of pristine conditions for the for the news work that goes on and whether this involves uh, objectivity or it involves uh, ethics or it involves um, balance or moderation uh, those are all things that yeah I'd like if I if somebody said to me give me your aspired recipe for what journalism could be yeah they might be in there but is that what journalism is no it's not uh, you know and so I think that, you know, we've lost sight of this, this stuff on that end. Things like perspective, like position, like irony, like satire, like all of the tools by which we make meaning of what we see. 
and by which we make meaning of the things that we come into contact with in the public sphere. We have created a kind of reduced kind of, you know, um, dish of things that we've left at the side all the stuff that in my view um, is what makes journalism so vital and so interesting. And we've done it largely because it fits our larger narratives about, about the Enlightenment, about modernity, about rationality, um, mm. that don't necessarily see themselves played out when you actually get to the ground of what journalism is. Um, and I liken this, I'd say this a lot, that it's kind of like, it's, 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 a, it's journalism in the imagination rather than journalism on the ground. And everybody needs an imagined sense of themselves, right? So there's nothing wrong with imagination. I'm actually quite a, quite a, a heavy proponent for it. But if that aspiration is so blinding that you can't even look down and recognize what's right there in front of your feet, then it's not doing its job. And I think that's where we are in journalism today. It's it's interesting that in your in your your comment just now you you referenced um, I think implicitly your most recent book right what journalism could be and 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 I want to follow up on that because it, to me I mean like what you just articulated is this beautiful tension between what we generally teach and talk about in journalism can be interpreted as, as things that we can control and we can measure and we can sort of, like you said, codify and also um, defend when people from the outside come and check out like, what are you guys actually doing, right? What are you teaching? Is that, does that belong at the university? Um, right. Um, um, versus all the things that journalism could be. And, and, and uh, the collection of essays and the way you contextualize them in, in that particular book, in, in your, 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 your 2017 book, What Journalism Could Be, is very much, I, I've read that very much as a sort of uh, argument or perhaps even manifesto towards embracing a much more, like in a book you call it, a much more porous definition of journalism, right? A, a journalism of possibilities and opportunities rather than this thing that it is. And the, or that it should be, right. and and um, um, it's 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 um, uh, something in in recent work that I done with Tamara Witzke we found as well by looking at journalism startups all over the world is that while they embrace the basic values of journalism, they turn it into a many splendor thing. Right? There's not a single startup that looks exactly like any of the other ones, and they all come up with their own funky ways of doing things. Right. <laughs> So it's, it's and, and, and we decided at some point, look, we're not going to critique this, we're going to celebrate it. Right? I mean, how awesome is it that they're all doing this? And yes, they might not be surviving three years from now, but that intrinsically doesn't matter. Now, um, 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 how do you, uh, how can we um, embrace that kind of uh, multiplicity in journalism's is, if you will, like, 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 other than like you do, like, uh, advocate it and, and write about it, fight for it, write a manifesto on it. Like, like, how can we mm -hmm. challenge uh, these these sort of like existing models of journalism? Is that true? That true? These kind of publications, or is it? Yeah, I mean, what are the ways in which we can sort of uh, diversify the narrative? I mean, I liken it to a school that has a dress code. And when the dress code is put to the side, right. you wait and you see what comes in. You know, I mean, we haven't put the dress code aside. We're nowhere near putting the dress code aside. And look, I mean, I'm being, I'm being you know, glib, but I, I think it is more complicated than just putting the dress code aside because clearly, you know, we have, you know, in, in most, most, uh, uh, you know, late modern settings, right? We have institutional cultures in which the institutions are building off of each other. So, you know, you open up journalism, what's going to happen to education? You open up journalism, what's going to happen to politics or to, or to the market, right? To, to capitalism. Uh, you know, it's well, capitalism in this case, <laughs> in this setting, not in every setting. But the point is, is that all of these institutional settings are part of a larger environment, um, mm -hmm. all of which, you know, are driven by this kind of 
aspired, um, you know, very subjunctive notion of what, what things should be. Highly normative. Um, mm. I just don't, I, I think that we've just got to let it go. And I mean, I think that we're seeing this in, in blinding colors in terms of how the U.S. news media have been dealing with, with Trump. Because what we've got here is we've got a set of journalistic routines and practices and identities that clearly are not working, clearly are not working. And it's just taking forever for the, the, the minds that are in these entities to say, we got to loosen this one up. We got to let go of this. You know, we got we to gotta stop doing this and let's try this instead. Because journalism is never really has to question itself at that level. Um, it is, I mean, I think that, you know, journalists are covering him a little bit more aggressively right now, but it's a travesty what's been going on here in the news media environment. And I, I really, I, they, you know, journalists and media practitioners writ large are looking to models that simply are not attuned to the, today's circumstances, period. Is, is that for you a very particular example of what you've called the ahistoric bias in journalism, right? Like that it's sort of blind to its own history beyond the history of the thing, of, of the issues that it covers? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, why are we acting like a free, new, a free news media environment has never been tackled by autocracy or authoritarianism? It happens all the time. Right. It has happened multiple times in each environment. So, you know, there's this inability, not only a historic, but also um, a kind of spatially reduced, you know, that you look only within your system. I mean, how many people, you know, how many news organizations or news platforms within the United States are understanding the parallels with news platforms and organizations elsewhere in the world who have long been fighting against autocratic uh, tendencies and authoritarian creep? This is, you know, this is, it's outrageous, you know? And, you know, I mean, I think that the the, another thing that is important, I think, to mention about the ahistoric bias of journalism is, you know, we, at least in the United States, I know there are some countries where, where there's more history, but the United States media are pretty, um, they're pre they turn a blind eye to a lot of historical, historical analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just stupid. It's just stupid, especially when we look at how we, where we are today and how ill-equipped we are to deal with what's going on uh, with Trump uh, and uh, the kind of erosion um, of democratic freedoms. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised. There's nothing surprising about what's going on, but there is much that is disappointing in terms of the media not taking the lead in kind of pushing back and helping us understand more fully. Um, what is what has happened and what is yet to come? I mean, this is all this is all still in in progress, and uh, yeah, and it's it's not you know it's going to get worse before it gets better, you know, and so we don't really have the luxury of time, and and yet. So is is this would it, would it be safe to say? Would I be safe to say that this particular? argument is the key argument that drives your new book or the uh, that the, your forthcoming book how the cold war drives the news um there's a lot of arguments in that book i mean i think that what i'm basically <laughs> i don't want to reduce it sorry <laughs> what i'm basically what i'm basically arguing in that book is that though um though when the cold war ended the the narrative was such that said um it, it ended, right? And it, with it went all of the institutional uh, 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 priorities and practices and standards that were tied in with the Cold War. And what I argue is that's not true, mm -hmm. that the Cold War simply went underground and stayed underground and kept kind of driving and motivating and pushing institutional cultures, not just in journalism, but mainly in journalism and, you know, kind of rearing its head around particular events that needed a very clear, um, a very clear narrative to help people make sense of them. So 
you know, rears its head around 9-11, rears its head, you know, around, uh, around uh, certainly around uh, uh, Trump. Um, I was joking at the beginning of Trump's uh, uh, administration or election that I hoped I could get the book done before, you know, the next Cold War was already upon us, you know. Um, I didn't get it done, unfortunately, I will. But I think that, you know, this Cold War mentality, this mindset is so um, infused mm -hmm. inside of how media practitioners work in the United States uh, and so unaware of that. Uh, they are so unaware of its presence um, th there's a lot of work to do. Um, right. Certainly Trump is changing the narrative uh, seven times each day. It's exhausting. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no question that this question of the Cold War um, is very much a reality. Uh, perhaps now more so, more obviously than it was when I began the book. Because when I began the book, nobody was talking about the Cold War. Right. That's how long I've been working on the book. But, um, and now everybody's talking about the Cold War. So I hope I get the book done before there's, there's no more anything to talk about. <laughs> it's, it's just so funny because er, earlier today, I was looking uh, at, on Reddit. I, was just, I sometimes check it there because it's, it's an interesting source of all kinds of things. But um, there were, was actually uh, one of the most popular discussions of today was a discussion about people from all over the world complaining about the fact that their newspapers and news station, television stations were always talking about America and Russia. And can't they just talk about our own country and what's happening? And I mean, it's a headline is always what's happening in, with Putin, what's happening with like, whoa, <laughs> Barbie's certainly on to something. <laughs> there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very uh, particular. Uh, um, if we broaden the conversation a little bit, and you're already doing this all the time, uh, not just focusing on journalists as media practitioners, but media practitioners in general. I see you started the Center for Media Risk uh, um, at, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, and it's, it's very deliberately framed to talk about media practitioners uh, rather than journalists, right? And of course, it includes journalists and a specific focus is journalists and will always be, of course. But it's very much about how media practitioners all over the world are under various, in various circumstances, unable to do what they want to do what they're supposed to be doing. Um, um, can tell you a little, a little bit more about the center and, and, and why it's sort of the broad focus and, and why now specifically? Right. Well, I mean, actually, the center was a different kind of center before. Um, it was the Scholars Program in Culture and Communication, um, which was about kind of creating a space for thinking about culture and communication. Right. And um, I, in 2016, was a fellow at the Collegium, the Helsinki Collegium. Mm -hmm. um, so I had the privilege and pleasure uh, and uh, uh, difficulty of being in Helsinki when Trump was elected. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the day of, I walked back into the Collegium and, you know, there were there were scholars, fellows there with me from Poland and from Lithuania and from Russia and from uh, Hungary. And, you know, and they said, well, what did you expect? And I remember thinking, wow, how naive were we? And, and, you know, there were certain questions going on around, you know, like, had people not been telling the truth to pollsters? Well, of course not, right? Like, so like <laughs> there, were, there were all these internal, like small questions that have had become so much part of the kind of default political processing in, in the United States um, that really woke me up and I thought, wow, like, like, right, like we have to let, I, and, I, and that's where the Center for Media at Risk was born, that I thought, this is about media practitioners, this is about media practitioners who are soon going to be facing unbelievable degrees of uh, authoritarian populism. I mean, you could already see that in the beginning. And from the beginning, I mean, it was very clear where this was going for anybody with any inkling of historical uh, uh, knowledge, right? You could say, I mean, this, this is such a pattern 
unfolding um, of authoritarian creep that Trump has been engaging in. And I realized that, you know, there really wasn't anything out there for thinking about media practitioners writ large. Um, and specifically, I was thinking about, yes, journalists, but also uh, documentarians, uh, documentary filmmakers, uh, digital posters of all kind, and people in the entertainment domain, all of whom were involved in crafting a particular kind of media environment in the face of political intimidation, in an environment in which the political arm, right, of wherever they were was intent on shutting them down. And I thought this this is like, I mean, you know, it's, it's you know, like a true American, you know, it's like, it, well, I wait till it happens to the United States before I decide to do something about it, you know, in all of its global manifestations. I, I apologize for that, but it was so clear to me that, you know, that this was something that was desperately needed. And honestly, the center has been, it's been a gift because going through four years of Trump with the center there and the, the, the degree of investment, the excitement, everybody we talk to wants to be involved. Everybody we've approached, would you like to you know, be an affiliate, wants to be an affiliate. I, you know, we are faced with more um, requests to do programming than we can possibly accommodate. Mm. So it's like, clearly it's hitting, you know, it's hitting, hitting a very relevant note. But it is a note that is based on the very simple lesson that all historians of autocracy know, which is authoritarianism gets in by the, 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 the space with the least amount of resistance. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is you need to, you need to call, call all of them into conversation with each other. Right. And so, it, you, know, it's, it, you know, some people would say, well, entertainment, yeah, entertainment. You know, what television gets put forward, what, what plot lines get dropped, you know, what, uh, what movies get produced. Um, and this was, you know, of course, before Me Too, you know, which gave a whole nother side of intimidation uh, to the story. Um, but the point is, is that it's not only about getting um, uh, documentarians, digital posters, journalists and, and uh, entertainment folk to talk to each other, but it's about getting practitioners and scholars in the same room as, as well. And, you know, as a former journalist, you know, I mean, you know this, Mark, once, once a hack, always a hack. You never leave journalism behind. And so there's a kind of uh, quiet satisfaction that I have in being able to create a platform that allows practitioners and scholars to speak more with each other. And, you know, it's, we've, you know, we've got arms all over the world, um, in every continent. We've got people who are involved in certain kinds of initiatives uh, uh, with the center or, or, or about the center. And so it's really, it's been, it's been an enormously gratifying uh, uh, period. I mean, for all the discussion in, in the field, in our literature, right, in journalism studies particularly about the decline of journalism, the disintermediation of journalism, the, 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 the decline in public trust in journalism, and so on and so forth. It is interesting that leaders in general, political leaders in general, and the more authoritarian slash populist ones in particular, are so hell-bent on attacking journalism. If journalism was that much in decline and untrustworthy and people didn't really care about it, then right? But there's right, right. Apparently, journalism still matters perhaps more than we sometimes yes. think it does. Yeah. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's such a it's such a wonderfully foundational point that people just don't think about, you know, why are the media being attacked in Hungary? Why are the media being closed down, you know, in, in Azerbaijan, you know, right. they just don't even think they, you know, they just think, well, they must deserve it. Yeah. Or they are actually telling the truth and it matters what they do. Yeah. Right. right. Wow. Well, we, I, 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 we could go on forever. That's always the case with these kind of conversations. But, but I also gonna keep 
some time because uh, um, 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 we have other things to do today. Um, so I want to <laughs> I, I want to close the, uh, uh, the the conversation for now and and just thank you so much so much for for your kindness and your your words and your thoughts and your work. And a, any news when the new book oh, is going to be finished? Now I'm pressuring you. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> it I, will it's, come. It's taken a slight. It's taken a slight pause. Good. There's a lot else going on right now. I'm okay with it. Um, Lovely. I want to thank you for, first of all, for having me, but second of all, for being so patient because I. It took a while for me to be able to say <laughs> yes. Let's do this. So I, I really appreciate your perseverance. This was great fun.